So what we're going to be doing is uh, uh, the, the trailing portion of uh, the last lecture, I have not had time to record it. Part of it has to do with the fact that uh, we haven't managed to coordinate with MediaTek who are overbooked. Turns out I should actually book my rooms sufficiently in advance for them to find the time. We'll figure out how to record that final bit and put it out. Uh, we'll put it out this week. That covers uh, batch normalization, dropout, basically the two key topics, right? Uh, the, uh, we are going to move on. We are going to talk about scanning, right? So the story so far, we've uh, seen that uh, multilayer perceptrons are universal function approximators, Boolean functions, classifiers, regressions. They can be trained through variants of gradient, variations of gradient descent. The kind of models we've considered so far are something like this. You give it an input, an image maybe, and or a vector input. I'm calling it a vector, but in your homeworks, you would have observed that you don't necessarily have to arrange your data as a vector. They're just conceptually vectors. So when, I, when, we, uh, when we asked you to look at context to uh, analyze any particular, uh, uh, any particular input vector, you were given recordings which actually get, were a matrix of vectors. And I, and one of the things we were, you were asked to do was to actually consider k vectors of con context on either side to classify any particular vector. And the naive thing for you to do would have, would have been to actually just sort of patch all of these things down below here and make a really long vector of this kind and then pass that to your classifier, but that's very silly because you're basically repeating data that's already there. So in that case, this perceptron, these, these perceptrons over here would actually be looking at this entire block of data, <laughs> but what are they really classifying? The vector in the middle, right? This is how we actually implemented things. Now this is uh, of relevance to today's lecture. So. Uh, now, the, regardless of how you thought about it, the kind of uh, models we've seen so far have this structure. They feed forward, they look at a single block of, a single block of data, and they perform, perform classification. You'd be looking at maybe this segment of your uh, input and deciding you know, whether it was class one or class 135 or whatever. But now, here's another problem. I give you a recording of this kind. This recording, as uh, in the case of your homework, it's been converted to a sequence of vectors. It's a spectrographic representation. So x-axis is time, y-axis is frequency. The intensity, the color intensity at any pixel basically gives you how much the, the value, the spectral value at that time, at that frequency, the energy in the signal at that time, at that frequency. So now I give you this input. I ask you, does the signal include the word welcome? Now, using uh, the naive approach, how would we do it? Simple enough. You pass this entire block to a multilayer perceptron, and you can train MLPs to perform, to, to, to decide if this recording has the word classifier, uh, welcome in it, right? Simple. But then here's the problem. I have these two recordings. Each of them has the word welcome, but they have the word welcome in different locations. So now if I pass the entire recording to an MLP, will an MLP that has been trained to find welcomes in the first recording find it in the second one? Why not? Because it's being connected to different neurons. There are, so basically, Vector-wise, what's happening? If I think of that entire input as a vector, then, so let's say I take my entire spectrogram, I unravel it, or think of just one row of it, for instance, right? So you don't even have to think about all, of, all the rows. In the one case, the signature of welcome was out here. In the other case, the signature of welcome was out here. So if I think of it as, points in some coordinate space, this data, this one, 
lay on this plane, right? It was invoking some components. And this guy lies on an entirely different plane. It's invoking a completely different set of components. They're completely disparate, although it's the same pattern, right? So a network that actually recognizes the word welcome in the first instance is not going to recognize the word in the second instance. So what we need is a simple network that will fire regardless of the location of the word welcome, where it is in this particular recording. I can give you another instance of the same problem. This time I sort of go into two dimensions. Here are all these pictures. How many of them have flowers? Anybody tell me? Four of them, right? Although some would argue that somewhere in that tra tractor is a flower. But anyway, so four of them have flowers and the rest don't. Now I ask you this question. I'm going to give you images of this kind and I'm going to ask you, does it have a flower? Now, same thing. If I uh, train a multi-layer perceptron that can detect flowers in the picture to the left, that MLP will not be able to detect flowers in the picture to the right. Yeah, For the very same reason that in the one case, it's one set of components that's invoked. In the other case, it's a completely different set of components that invo that's invoked. That first flower picture represents a flower in a completely different subspace than the second one. So uh, we need a network that will fire regardless of the precise location of the object. In other words, we need shift invariance. Basically, you have Many problems are the location of the pattern is not important. It's only the presence of the pattern. And conventional MLPs are sensitive to the actual location. Basically, different locations represent different subspaces. And so uh, what would happen is that if I just took this component pattern and shifted it by one position, you end up in a completely different subspace, a movement of, so in a, in a, a time signal, move, a movement by one sample or in an image, a movement by shift by one pixel puts you in a completely different subspace. And so something that recognizes the flower in one is not going to recognize the flower in the other, right? So you, are, you need to have shift invariance where the network will fire even if the pattern is shifted, like if the flower is shifted or if the word welcome is shifted. You want something that would fire in any case. So now, let me restate the problem. I have a recording of this kind. I want you to tell me if the word welcome has occurred in it. How would you do it? <coughs> Anybody? Lulan, how would you do it? So I'm asking you now, I'm asking you to detect, not to train, right? So Alex, if I asked you, gave you a recording of this kind and asked you if the word welcome happened in it, how would you find it? Brute force, can, right? That's exactly what I could do. I can build this MLP, which is de designed to detect the word welcome. And then I can scan. I think that's what you were trying to say too, right? So I can just go left to right, and look at each location and determine if the word scan has occurred there or not, right? Or the word welcome has occurred there or not. But what is the real question I'm asking? The question I'm asking is, did the word welcome occur anywhere in this image, in, the, in this recording? So I have this collection of decisions taken one at every position. How can I combine this collection of decisions to tell you if the word uh, welcome has occurred anywhere in the recording. Or, right? Basically, I can take an or, or alternately stated, I can pick the maximum of every one of these guys. If the word welcome has happened in even one location, the maximum is going to be a one, 
or close to a 1, the rest of them are going to be very small, right? If the welcome never occurred, the largest value you see is going to be small. And so I can take all of these guys and just put them through a max. And whatever pops out of the max, that is going to be my classifier output, correct? Easy enough. Or it doesn't even have to be a max. So think about it. The word welcome is not very precisely defined in time. Where exactly did I begin saying the sound ooh? Where did my uh end? Turns out it's not very precisely defined. So you would expect that a welcome pattern detector might detect a welcome here with high confidence. Then if you shift it a little bit by one sample, it's still going to kind of find the word welcome, right? Simply because of the way we, way we do things. It's only when you shift it off significantly that it's not. So instead of just saying, you know, uh, I can do something like a softmax, a max, or I can put a perceptron out there, look at a weighted combination. A weighted combination is going to say that if three adjacent locations all give me somewhat reasonably high scores for welcome, I'm more likely to fire, for, fire than if just one of them you know, gives me a very high score and everything else gives me zero because then that is more likely to be an outlier, right? Or I can do something even more sophisticated, although this is completely unnecessary, the, I can put the entire thing through an entire MLP, right? But the whole point is this. This is kind of overkill. You wouldn't actually be doing this. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Turns out that, uh, yeah, we'll get back to it. But the basic idea is simple. I can scan and I can pick the largest one. Or I can say, you know, do I get really large values in a small range of locations? And that's my softmax. And that's going to give me my output. Now, what do I have? I have a scanning MLP. I'm scanning with an MLP. I'm, the thing I had to decide was how wide is the patch over which I'm looking for the word welcome, right? And then I'm going for T going from one to the end. I'm scanning through time. At each location, I'm pulling out a segment of my image and I'm passing it through my MLP. And so I'm gonna get one decision for every instant. And I'm putting this collection of decisions through my softmax or my max, and that gives me an output. Make sense, right? Fairly trivial. But then this entire operation can be viewed as one giant network. Because I'm looking at each segment and I'm passing that output through a network. Then I'm taking all of their outputs and then putting that through a softmax, which is just one more element in my network, right? The entire operation is one giant network. So the uh, only difference over here between your standard network and this guy is that I have many subnets looking at the, or the network and all of these subnets are identical. That was the only difference between this and your standard network. I could have passed the entire input through a MLP or I can be having many copies of the same basic network looking for a pattern and combining their outputs. Both of them are just an MLP looking at, looking at the input. One has uh, uh, many identical subnets. So you can think of this entire thing as just one giant MLP. Those T's are basically like, like, like looking over adjacent blocks. The final softmax is just the final layer of the overall MLP, right? So I can write the entire thing as one giant MLP. Now, same thing with images. I have this image. I have to decide if there is a flower in it. So I start off with a flower detector, which is an MLP. And this flower detector is going to look at a patch of my image, and it's going to give you an output. And then I can begin scanning this left to right, and uh, I can uh, scan for the desired output, keep scanning this image left to right. At each location, I'm looking for a flower. And then when I scan the entire image like so, I'm going to get one decision at every location. I'm going to, I can take the entire collection of decisions and put it through a max. If the largest output is high enough, I have at least found at least one flower in the image, which is basically all I'm trying to do, right? So 
And okay, again, that could be a max, could be a soft max, it could be an MLP, it doesn't really matter. But the idea remains the same. You're scanning with an MLP, so uh, again, now you're going over the two dimensions, the X dimension and the Y dimension of the input, I and J are the X and Y dimensions. At each location, you're pulling out a, 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 a portion of the image corresponding to the size of the pattern that you're searching for the flower. This is what the MLP is actually looking at. And that is being passed through your MLP. And then you're getting, going to get one decision at every location. And then you're going to put that through a max or a soft max, right? And again, as before, this entire thing is just one giant network. It's one giant network with many copies where many of the subnets are identical in structure. So this whole thing is one giant network where the last element over here is just the final component of the network. This is a giant MLP, right? So given this, how would I train this network? These are just really large. Now, by the way, if you've been looking at the slide numbers, this slide number is 67, and this last slide number is 56. What happened? I suggest you keep track of the side slide numbers. The rest, I like to hide slides simply because I'm not gonna have time to go over all of these in the class. Please take a look. It's about how, you know, shortcuts for drawing diagrams to represent these figures that we will use in the quizzes and further explanations at various times, right? So please do take a look at the slides, yes? I had a question about using softmax in the last year. Softmax just gives us relative activation. Uh, it gives us how much a particular uh, like window is activated with respect to the other windows, right? So it could be just a perceptron. So when I'm seeing a softmax, a better idea would be to think of it as a perceptron where a perceptron is looking at weighted combinations, right? And if the weighted combination exceeds a threshold, it's going to fire, otherwise it doesn't. Okay, so it's, it's not the soft max comp aspect of it per se, it's the fact that you're looking at weighted combinations which would give you information like at least three consecutive guys must have you know, high matches, right? High scores, make sense? Okay, so now, so, how can I train this? This is just one giant large network, right? If it's one giant large network, here is the lovely thing. I don't have to go off and train a flower detector separately or a welcome detector separately. I could just be giving you lots and lots of these recordings and say, these guys have welcomes, these don't. You have an instance of what is called weak labeling. You're getting away with weak labels. A strong label is where I give you the exact segment of audio which says this is the word welcome. And I, I uh, give you, and, and then you get to train with those. A weak label is here is a bag. Somewhere in this bag is a positive instance, right? Think about this. You're trying to build a classifier for you know, cars, pictures of cars. And instead of giving you a picture of a car, I give you a basket which has many, many photographs in it. And I say some of these photographs are cars. Then I give you these other baskets, which have many photographs in them, but none of them are cars, right? So at this point, I'm not labeling every individual photograph. I'm just giving you these baskets. And then I'm saying, okay, now find me a, you know, a car detector. That's basically what you have over here. You are not actually labeling every location in the image. You're just saying somewhere in this recording, there is the word welcome. And that information is sufficient because we've composed the entire thing as one giant network. Right? Does that make sense or did I confuse anybody? If it didn't make sense, tell me now, right? So anyway, so now I can just use straight up back propagation. I, gave you, I can give you lots of recordings, some with the word welcome, some without. And I'll tell you which ones have the word welcome, which ones don't, and you can just use back prop to train the network, but there's a constraint. And the constraint is that these are shared parameter networks, right? So what this means is that when I built this giant network, whether it was for analyzing the speech or whether it was for analyzing the image, you, had, you basically had many copies of the same subnet looking at every uh, block in the original image and they are all identical. So this giant network actually has many subnets that are identical. 
So these are shared parameter networks. What I mean by shared parameter is that you have imposed the structure that this parameter here and this parameter here are going to be identical, right? And so it's a shared parameter network. And so any kind, any, any uh, uh, gradient update or learning algorithm that you use must take into consideration the fact that this is a shared parameter network. So how would you actually go about learning in a shared parameter network? Consider a simple network with shared weights. So this, I mean, this business of sharing parameters is not just restricted to things like scanning. You can do it anywhere. So I could decide completely arbitrarily that I have this arc network, and in this network, I want this weight and this weight to have identical values. If I impose this, if I impose this restriction ex externally, this is a shared parameter network because I'm forcing these two guys to have, always have the same value, right? And so, now in terms of learning, what happens? I know both of these guys have the same value, say WS. If I perturb WS a little bit, remember how we actually did gradient descent? We were computing how much a per small perturbation in any parameter would change the output. So if I perturb WS a little bit, two guys are going to change and they are both going to influence the output. So I can draw the influence diagram like so. This common value WS is going to influence both those weights. Both those weights are going to influence the output and thereby the divergence. So if I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the common value that both of these guys share, then following this influence diagram, which by now we must be very comfortable with having done this in the quizzes too, right, uh, is it just means that the derivative of the divergence with respect to the common value is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to the first weight times the derivative of the, that weight with respect to the common value plus the derivative of the divergence with respect to the second weight times the derivative of that weight with respect to the common value. But then these guys, dw, ij over dws, that's just one because the value is being exactly identically shared. So these, uh, these second components are actually one the derivative of the divergence with respect to the shared value is simply the sum of the derivatives of the divergence with respect to all of the individual terms that are supposed to have the same value. Right? Yes? Doesn't make any difference, right? So when you're saying neural networks are function, neural networks are universal function approximators, you're just speaking of what they are capable of. It doesn't mean that any specific network is going to be able to model any given function. Then obviously it cannot model everything, right? So that's a, that's a capacity statement. That's not a statement about individual networks. Yeah? Because we are saying that the WS, I'm, I'm saying both of these guys have the same value, right? So I'm saying WIKJ, literally that statement is saying WIJK equals, what is the other one, WMN, in that case also L equals WS. There's an equality statement, right? That's what sharing parameter sharing is, so the derivative is one. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yes? Nothing. I mean, it's just the, the, the uh, look, at, look at what we are doing eventually. Look at what, eventually what happened over here. When I think of, it, it's, a, it's a way of, it's one way to, how we're going to be thinking about the problem. But as far as the input is concerned, the input is the entire, you know, image or the entire signal, right? Yeah, but the, the point really is that, uh, the, so don't, don't get too carried away by what we've said so far because we're gonna build on this because the actual number of unique parameters is just going to be the size of the smallest block because that's being repeated, right? And uh, so this means that it kind of becomes, as we'll see, independent of the size of the input itself. If I'm just gonna be scanning effectively, I'm scanning. So if I'm scanning, it doesn't matter whether I'm scanning a short input or a wide input. 
the size of the, at the lowest layer, what is the actual size you're considering? The width of the block that you're scanning with. That's about it, right? Yeah. So, so going back here, what does this mean? When I'm doing a shared parameter network, every one of those squares that I've drawn on the flower picture is being analyzed by the same MLP. And all of their outputs are being passed on to the final same subnetwork. And all of their outputs are being passed on to a softmax or, a, or an MLP or whatever else. So which means that if you look at those red arrows in the first figure, all of those guys are the same weight because basically they're the same edge of the subnet that's scanning the figure, right? So when I think of the giant MLP, I'm, it's the equivalent of saying all of those guys share a parameter. So also all of the lines that are paint colored blue, can you see those? They have the same value, right? All of the lines that are colored green, they have the same value. So in other words, if I want to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to that red arrow, I'm going to have to sum over every copy of that red arrow when I'm scanning the image and adding the partial derivatives. Make sense, right, to everybody? And so here is how the actual gradient descent is going to be when you're using a shared parameter network. For every set S, there's a set of weights which have the same value, and there are many such sets. For every set, you're going to compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the common value of that set. And you're going to be performing gradient descent with respect to this common value of the parameter for that set. Right? And this one, I can, let's zoom in. What is, how do you actually compute the derivative of this common value, of the divergence with respect to this common value? You'd be going over every single parameter within that set, computing the local divergence with respect to the parameter, and then you're adding the entire lot. That's going to give you the derivative of the divergence with respect to the common value over the entire set. And that derivative, of course, is going to be computed by backpropagation. Well, so story so far. Position invariant pattern classification can be performed by scanning. 1D in the case of uh, sound or one-dimensional signals, or uh, 2D in the case of images, where you can have things happening anywhere in the image. But this, this, there's nothing special about two dimensions. This can be generalized to three, four, or any number of dimensions. The basic concept still holds, right? Uh, and scanning is equivalent to composing a large network with repeating subnets, basically. Basic, so the large network has shared subnets. And learning in scan networks, back propagation rules must be modified to combine gradients from parameters that share the same value. This principle applies in general for networks with shared parameters. Questions so far? Because we're gonna get more complex really quickly. This was the easy bit, okay? Not necessarily, right? So when you compute the derivative, uh, the derivative is also considering the input. For at those locations, you'd expect the derivative to be small. Because you're saying that in this location, because the input doesn't have the pattern. Yeah. If I move this guy a tiny bit, remember you're speaking of infinitesimal changes. You don't really expect to see a large change in the output. But this is the standard back, back propagation rule. We are not changing anything. This holds for pretty much any pattern, right? So you give it any kind of feature that you're looking at. It doesn't, the fact that you have a shared parameter network doesn't really matter, does it? I'm saying, like suppose there was an image uh, with and without a flower. Correct. So it has learned to classify the image with a flower, uh, with, along with its background. Yes, so now, th now th consider a general, forget about the fact that these are shared parameters, okay. right? So if you take any odd MLP, now, when you're trying to, to perform pattern classification over a specific kind of input, that input is going to have components which are relevant to the class and components that are irrelevant to the class. Right. 
what do you expect that these the derivatives of the parameters with respect to the irrelevant components to be? That's exactly the same situation here, right? That's, so nothing changed, not, absolutely nothing changed, right? Okay. So now, the, and what we've got here, let's look, take a closer look at the scanning, keeping in mind that scanning is like looking, operating on this with one giant network, okay? Now, let's look at what happens. The entire MLP, which is this guy, operates on every single window of the input, right? Every single, so which may be an input image or an input sound or whatever else, right? So within each window, what happens? Consider just this first block. You have four neurons in the first layer. Every one of those is computing an output. You have three neurons in the second layer in our example. Those three neurons are looking at the four outputs of the four neurons from the first layer. And they're computing their output. So you get three outputs. Then here I have, so the next thing would happen is this guy, right? And then the final one is looking at the outputs of the neurons from the second layer. So this is the order in which you, have perform you would be performing the computations if you were scanning. You'd, within this block, you'd first compute the first four neurons. From those, you'd compute the next three neurons, then you'd compute the next two neurons, then you'd compute the final neuron, right? Then you shift over one block, you compute the first four neurons, then you compute the next two neurons, and then you compute the one neuron. Then you shift over one block, which could be just shifted by one pixel, and repeat the same comput computation. But now, so basically, you would be doing this for every single block, like so, until you've done the entire computation. At every single block, you've computed the first four neurons, then you've computed the second neuron, the, the two neurons of the second layer, then you've computed the final neuron, and then eventually the entire lot of outputs is being put through the softmax. Right? This is, this is the standard scanning. But now I decide to change the order in which I do things, okay? Just for one neuron. For the first neuron, I'm going to compute the output of the first neuron on the first block. Then I just move on, and only for the first neuron. I compute the output for the second block, and the third block, and the fourth block, and the fifth block, all the way to the end. Okay? And then for the rest of the, the remaining three neurons in the, so this entire thing, okay? And then for the remaining three neurons, I just look at the first block and compute the remaining three neuron values. So now I have all four neural outputs for the first block. So from those, I can compute the two in the next layer, and then I can compute the one in the final layer, right? Will this change the output that I got in the final, hour, final layer for that block? It's not, right? The fact that I just did this first guy beforehand doesn't actually change what happens in the first column. I can do this, so this means I can also uh, do this for the second guy, right? So I can do this for the first guy. So this wouldn't change what happens, what happens in the final neuron for the first block. I could scan the first two guys beforehand and then perform the rest of the computations. Or I could just take all four of my first layer neurons and compute them on every single block on the input. Then take the first column of these guys, compute the two neural outputs from the second layer and then compute the final output. That is still not going to change the final output of the first block, right? Nothing changed. All that happened was it changed the order of computation. So now, that, that logic can be carried over to the next layer. What I can do is, now I can just scan the entire input using the four, four neurons of the first layer. Then I can scan the entire, uh, all blocks for one of the neurons from the second layer and do it all the way to the end and do the same for the second neuron of the second layer and do it all the way to the end and then compute the final output for the first block. This is still not going to be any different from what if I would have computed if I just computed the first block all by its own, own lonesome self, right? This hasn't changed. And now so I can scan with the final neuron itself. 
and then put the entire thing through the softmax. Will this change the final output? No, right? I'm still performing the same scanning operation. The only thing that happened was I changed the order in which I performed the computation. Correct? Precious thing? Okay, I'm just gonna, I just wanna make sure that you get the idea of what is going on. So why is this a trivial thing? Let's go back and look at our, uh, our uh, network when we were scanning. We were going across time, but then each, at each time you were pulling out a block and you were putting it through an MLP, then you put the collection of outputs through a softmax. So let me expand this. What was happening here is that I was going across time Within each, at each time instant, I was going through all the layers of my MLP. For each layer, I was going over all of the neurons in that layer, right? So I, I had my input. I had my input. Scanning meant I went over time, but within each guy, at each location, I first computed all the outputs of my first layer. And when I computed all the outputs of the first layer, I'm basically computing the outputs of each of my neurons in the first layer. And then from these guys, then I go to the next layer and compute the outputs of each of my neurons in the next layer. And then finally, I compute the, I go to the last layer and compute the output of the neuron in that layer. The first layer alone works on a block that is derived from the input. That's this guy, hell equals one. The rest of them simply work on the outputs of the previous layer, right? This is clear. This is what I did when, sc when scanning. Now what would happen? So here's, here are the components. The first one is over time. The second one is over layers. The third, th the third loop is over the neurons. Look at the entire pseudocode, okay? I'm going to flip the order of the loops. Will this change the output, final output? Because you're really decided, interested in the final outcome, this really doesn't change the order of the final output. So now, instead of going over time and then going over layers and going over neurons, I'm going to go over layers, over neurons, and then over time. That's basically what I did when I showed you how I modified the uh, computation, right? And so this is the resulting operation that we actually saw when I said I'm redoing the computation somewhat differently. So I can do the whole thing in vector notation. Instead of writing out the loops, I'm saying pulling out a block and then showing every operation and showing the operation computation for individual neurons. We can use a standard vector notation that you guys have been writing in your code, but this is what it's going to look like. There are only two loops. One is over time, while the other is over layers. I flip the order, and that's basically what happened. Right? Okay. Same thing with 2D. Nothing really changes. So when I'm performing, uh, when I'm scanning this picture, I have this uh, MLP. It has an input layer. It has the subsequent layers of the network. And this entire MLP is performing scanning the input. But take a look at a single neuron. What is the single neuron doing in the first layer, first and layer? It's looking, it's computing an affine combination of all of the pixels in some, in some patch, and then, and then applying an activation to that affine combination. It computes a value, right? So instead of computing the entire MLP at each block, I can just take this first guy and I can begin computing its output at every location. And I, had, I arranged the output in the same order that as the original image. So that first neuron has actually now mapped out the entire input and it's created its own map, right? I can do this with each of my neurons in the so the first neuron has scanned this input and produced, an, produced a map. I can do this with each of the neurons in my first layer. And now, suppose I want to 
classify, decide if this particular block in the middle has a flower or not. All I have to do is to pick those values that from the maps produced by the neurons in the first layer that correspond to the, you know, the outputs they produced when they looked at that particular block of the input and pass those to the subsequent layers of the MLP. Right? So this is exactly the same as what we were doing with the 1D case. I'm just changing the order of computation. Instead of scanning the entire input with my MLP, first I'm going to scan the entire input the, with, the, with the neurons in the first layer, and then I can just pick out the specific outputs at different locations to decide, to pass it through the rest of the MLP to decide what the classification output is at that location. And of course, this thing can be recursed, right? So now, the second neurons in the second layer, they can look at the outputs of the, uh, the, the maps produced by the neurons in the first layer in the top left location. And when they do that, they are going to make their own decision about whether the top left location box in the input image has a flower or not. And then I can scan, right? So the neurons in the second layer can do the same thing and produce entire maps. And then finally, if I want to decide if this block has a figure or flower in it or not, I just have to pick up the corresponding locations from the maps produced by the neurons in the second layer, pass them through the final layer of my MLP, and that's going to give me a decision. Right. Everybody see what, I'm going, what is happening over here? This is basically this uh, two-dimensional analog of what happened with one dimensions, what happened in one dimensions. And of course, the final guy too is now going to, can just operate on the maps produced by the uh, second layer and it's going to give me an output for every location. And that can finally be put through a uh, max or whatever else to, to decide if the image has a flower. The slides have a lot more text, but you get the idea immediately, correct? So what happened over here? This, so I can either just retain them as a map or I can expand them out and put them through an MLP. It doesn't really matter, right? But what happened over here? This is basically exactly what we did with the uh, one-dimensional case. So in the standard scanning, you had the image, the image, which is large. So you scanned over, over all x, y positions in the image, you scan the input, and then when you scan the input, you uh, at each location, you pulled out a segment of the image, which was that slice, and you ran an MLP on it, and then finally, you performed a softmax on the outputs of the entire co of the computation, right? So if I were to write it out explicitly, it's going to look like so. At each location, I'm going over all of the layers, I'm going over all of the neurons, and I'm basically performing exactly the same operation as here. But now, I can flip the order. Instead of going over the positions and then going over the layers and then going over the neurons, I can go over the layers and the neurons and then over the positions. And this doesn't really change the output of the network, right? So, this is basically what you get when you're scanning with your MLP. And that's the final operation that we actually performed. I can write the whole thing in vector notation as before, uh, instead of trying to write things out for every individual neuron. But the basic idea was this, instead of scanning over the network picture and going through all the layers in each location, I scanned over the layers and within each layer, I went through the layers and within each layer, I scanned the uh, network, right? Uh, so they scan the input. So you get an idea of what's happening here. Now, I'm going to break this down one step further. What a, remember, from way back when, what does an MLP really learn? An MLP is sort of decomposing an input into parts. So if I were trying to uh, build a classifier which decides if the input is in one of these two yellow boxes or not, then I can just 
first I'm going to find the lowest lines, then I'm going to build the little pentagons, then I'm going to combine the pentagons and so on, correct? So, and then finally take a decision. Same thing, if I were trying to build a digits classifier, which looked at this pixel, para, uh, this pixel grid and decided if the input was a digit or not, then uh, I can, uh, the, you would expect the lowest layer neurons to uh, pick out the salient features of digits. The next layer neurons to decide uh, if there are actual digits or not. And then you're going to combine the lot, correct? So let's take carry the whole idea, same idea over to the uh, network itself, to this guy. Now, when we were sort of doing what we just did, when we, when we analyze the entire input using an MLP, so you looked at blocks of the image and you are analyzing the entire block using an MLP. So the first layer in, of neurons in your MLP, that first layer was responsible for extracting all the salient features from the entire block. Subsequent layers only sort of operated on these features and figured out whether they were in the right combinations or not. So those first layer neurons, they were trying to cap capture features about the entire big picture. And the bigger the picture is, the more features you expect to get. So you really expect your first layer to be really very large to capture everything important about it, right? But then, let me redo it somewhat differently. My first layer perceptrons are not going to be looking at that entire block. My first layer perceptrons are going to be looking at a sub-block within the entire image, okay? And then they're going to scan. So if the first layer perceptrons now look at sub-blocks and they begin scanning, like so, then what happens? The information about this entire block is no longer represented by a single pixel in the output map of the neurons in the first, first layer. It's actually represented by a grid of nine pixels in my example, right? So, now if I want the neurons in the subsequent layers to actually decide about this block, the neuron in the next layer is going to have to look at that block of inputs, that square of inputs in the map, or the square of outputs in the map produced by the neurons in the first layer. Oops, yes. Okay, so the yellow dotted square is the block over which I'm looking for the flower. So look at what's happening here. Good question because I'm sure others have the same question. So look at what's happening over here. In that red square, I'm look, trying, when I'm scanning the input, I have decided on the size of my flower, which is the red box, and I'm scanning, correct? So I still want to scan and input the size of that red box to decide if there's a flower. But in this case, the neurons in the first layer, they were looking at that entire box and they were producing a single, each neuron was producing a single output. And then the neurons in the next layer were just reading these values and operating on them, right? So now, instead I'm going to change that. I'm going to say the neurons in the first layer are looking at regions of the image the size of the white box and they're going to scan. So if you now want to cover the bigger region, you're going to have to look at nine of these outputs. Make sense? Right? Right, and so you're going to have to look at nine of these outputs in the output of, from the output of each of these neurons. Here I have four neurons, so I'm going to have to look at this block of nine outputs from the output of the first neuron, the block of nine outputs from the output of the second neuron, the block of nine outputs from the output of the second, third neuron, and the fourth, and then all of those are going to be combined. So all of these guys are going to be combined uh, by the neuron in the second layer before it makes a decision about this one block. And it's going to repeat the same process for every position as it scans, right? So, everybody clear? What I've done is I've distributed my pattern. Instead of forcing my first layer neurons to learn all of the features in the input, I've smeared the representation across two layers. I've allowed the neurons in the first layer to look for smaller patterns, 
and I've allowed the neurons in the second layer for to look for larger patterns, but somehow also consider the spatial arrangement. So uh, what this means is if you actually look at any single pixel in the output of the neurons of the next layer, any single pixel in the, or any single output in the, of the neurons in the next layer is really representing that entire yellow box, not just one small subregion in the yellow box. But then, interestingly, it's actually going to be able to, uh, so it effectively evaluates this entire yellow box, but it's actually able to figure out patterns like these, right? Now, if you look at the four neurons in the first layer, each of those four neurons, remember, we saw, we, we, we saw way back when that a neuron really is some kind of a correlation filter. It's trying to match the weights to the inputs. Every neuron is looking for a pattern. So the neurons in the first layer are looking for smaller patterns. The neuron is in the second layer are looking for combinations of these patterns found by the neurons in the first layer. So it might be able to say that, so let's say the neurons in the first layer find different components of a petal as their basic pattern. That second layer neuron can now say that the first guy must fire in the top left position, the second guy must fire in the center, the third guy must fire in the middle, the fourth guy must fire in the bottom right. It can actually find arrangements in the outputs of the neurons in the first layer to decide whether it's captured a relevant feature for the flower in the bigger yellow block, right? It can actually, so the spatial arrangement is kind of taken care of. But the interesting thing is that you're still just scanning with a shared parameter network. Although I've distributed everything, nothing really changed. It's still just the same basic structure. All that happened was that there was a little more sharing of parameters. How exactly was there more sharing of parameters? Now consider the simple example. So let's say the neurons in the first layer are only looking at regions the size of the yellow block, and let's say adjacent blocks don't overlap. Then a single neuron in the first layer is going to produce nine outputs within the big block, right? This is the equivalent of having nine copies of that neuron with identical weights, but these nine copies are looking at different regions of the, of the picture. So it's like having a shared parameter network with nine copies of the first neuron, nine of the second neuron, and nine of the third neuron, and so on. And the neurons in the second layer are actually looking at all of these guys. So there's no sharing of parameters in the second layer the way, the way we just saw it. But in the first layer, the nine copies of the first neuron are all identical. And each of them, except that each of them is looking at a different block of the input. Clear? Right. So now, this logic can be recursed, right? Now, I, instead of saying, I can try to build a pattern over three layers. I can say the first neurons in the first layer look at these really small regions, and they produce their map. The neurons in the second layer look at subregions. So the neuron in the second layer is looking at the larger, larger box, which is at groups of four neurons in the first layer. And the neurons in the third layer are going to be looking at at groups of boxes in the output of the neurons in the second layer. And the neuron the, now, as a result, the neuron in the third layer is actually looking over the entire box. What I've done is I've distributed the pattern over three layers, which allows it to, allows me to get me a more, uh, allows me to look for features at a finer resolution. Right. None of this really changes the fact that the, uh, Final, and then the final classifier just views the uh, outputs from all the locations as seen in the final map, right? Now, uh, the, none of this really changes the fact that this is just one giant MLP. Except now you have uh, shared parameters, but the shared parameter structure is somewhat more complicated. You have a more complex shared parameter structure, but the whole, whole structure still remains. Now, if this stuff is not very clear, then the next quiz should fix it for you. Uh, and uh, actually, the homework, homework two will fix it for you, okay? <laughs>
So this entire operation can still be viewed as one giant parameter network. So it probably begins to make more sense if you look at it again from the perspective of the pseudocode. The original scanning MLP was going over all XY locations and within each XY location it was going over layers and over the neurons. I can, so here's what it was. The blue block shows the scanning, the yellow shows the, the MLP itself. I can flip it and you're going over the layers and within each layer, you're actually scanning the entire input. But unlike the simple case, what is happening over here is this thing that I've sort of magically hidden and compute the Z, not expanded. Uh, first, there's no necessity for the size of the block that you're looking at within each layer to be the same as the size of the block that you're looking at in the next layer. So these things can be independent. And secondly, when you look at the actual computation itself, here is what happened. Previously, I was just looking at this guy, right? One vector of inputs before passing it on to the next guy. Here, what you would do is to look at a block of inputs, a rectangular block of inputs from the output of the previous layer. So at each layer, you have, say, a bunch of neurons in, each layer, in, in any given layer. That guy is going to produce a map of outputs, correct? And so this neuron will have a small set of weights corresponding to the size of the region in the output of the previous neuron that it's actually looking at. And so the first thing you would do is to slice out a region the same, same as the size of this weights. That's this y. And then you compute an inner product between these two guys, which is basically a component-wise multiply, and then you add them up. You're going to have the corresponding size also being sliced out from each of these four guys, because remember, you're looking at all of the four neurons from the, all of the neurons from the previous layer. Corresponding to each, there's going to be a different set of weights. So you'd be performing a component-wise multiply and then you'd be adding them all, and when you add them all, you're going to get one output corresponding to this region uh, in the maps of the previous layers, which basically corresponds to some region in the input image itself, okay? And this, having been computed, you're going to, this computation for just this layer, you'd be scanning this, you'd be performing this operation as you scan, and you keep computing things left to right to fill up the entire map. This entire operation, yes. So that's just like uh, the So this is a component Y. So this is like, you would be this guy, this location would multiply this, this location would multiply this, so. So this is, the, I'm just showing, I'm just uh, illustrating the computation, right? So it's this guy that's actually going here. This is, th these are just the weights. It's not the slice of the input. So the way I, would, uh, if I want to be absolutely didactic, I have all of these guys, these boxes would all be pointing to the corresponding neuron of the next layer. But in all, for this box, I'm going to have a set of weights exactly the same size as this guy. Right? Make sense? Or did I not answer your question? Right? But what is happening is after having performed this computation, you're going to keep sliding, and you're going to be scanning the input and repeating the computation over every block of this input. So this entire operation of performing this, comp the, you know, performing this component-wise multiply between weights and a block of the input and adding it up, basically looking for a pattern over the entire collection of maps from the previous layer and then scanning. That is a, that, that operation is called a convolution. This business of scanning for a pattern is called a convolution. And the entire network, of course, is going to be called a convolutional neural network as a consequence. I can write the whole thing also in vector form where instead of having four different maps, I can stack these four different maps into one 3D tensor. And then instead of having four different 
matrices of weights, I can think of one 3D tensor of weights. And the whole operation is, you can think of the thing, uh, you can think of these guys as forming a cube and I'm scanning the cube spatially to look for patterns, right? So why distribute? Why not just use the basic idea that we began with in the first place? It turns out that when you begin distributing parameter things in this manner, the number of parameters can really, 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 really become small. So consider this example. Let's say I'm looking for patterns in a k cross k block of the input. And let's say I have n1 neurons in the first layer, n2 neurons in the second layer, and n3 neurons in the, and the one neuron here in the final layer, right? So how many weights will I need? For each block, I need k squared weights because I'm looking at k squared pixels. So the first layer is going to require k squared. Forget about the plus one, that's for the bias. When you have a perceptron, remember you always have a bias, right? These are just perceptrons, but I'm ignoring the bias for now, okay? So you're gonna have k squared n1 weights for the first layer. Then you have n1 neurons in the first layer and n2 in the second, so you have n1, n2 neurons in the second layer and then so on, right? So that's going to be the uh, total number of parameters if you do not distribute. If you distribute parameters, then things change a little bit. The first layer, let's say I'm still looking at, I'm distributing this over two layers, right? And I'm still trying to look for, k, for patterns in a k cross k block. But the first layer is of neurons, every neuron in the first layer is looking at little l, uh, l cross l regions. So I have n1 neurons in the first layer, and each of them is looking at an L cross L region, so I'm going to have L squared N1 neurons parameters in the first layer. The second layer is going to be looking at K over L because I want to fill up the entire K block, right? So the second layer is going to be looking at K over L squared times N1, N2. For every pair of neurons, I'm actually looking at an entire block of pixels from the maps, so the, sec the second layer is going to be looking at k over L squared and one and two parameters, and then the subsequent are just, you know, N2, N3, and so on. So the number of parameters has changed. How much exactly did it change? You can, just, you can, you can continue this ad nauseum for any number of layers. Uh, won't go through the arithmetic, but maybe one in the quiz, just so you get an idea. But here is the uh, actual, here is an, uh, an actual comparison. In this example, I have, I'm trying to scan for uh, flowers or some whatever I am with, a person, I'm with an MLP which has four neurons in the first layer, two, two neurons in the second, and one in the final uh, layer. And I'm trying to look for patterns over 16 cross 16 pixels. So 16, 16 times 16 is 256. So 256 times four is 1024 parameters for just the first layer and then a small number for the remaining. So the total number of parameters was 1,034. But now, let me say the first layer is looking at little four cross four blocks, and the next layer is looking at four, four cross four blocks in the output of the first layer, right? So now because four cross four is 16, the first layer only needs N1 times 16 parameters. The next one needs N1, N2 times 16, because each of them is looking at a four cross four block. So that's going to be eight times 16. If you add up the total number of parameters, it just comes up to 160 weights. So just by distributing the representation over two blocks, over two layers, I have reduced the number of parameters, in this case, by more than a factor of five, by a factor of six. As you spread it out more and more, it's going to, the actual red reduction in the number of parameters is going to be several orders of magnitude to be scanning for very similar patterns. So yeah, yes? So by distributing, is it basically having multiple pooling layers? So we're not even speaking of pooling. There is no pooling over here, right? Okay. Uh, all I'm literally saying is, uh, instead of just saying, yeah, instead of, uh, so in one, in one case, I had my MLP and this guy was looking at this entire location and it was producing a map and each location represented a full block. 
if I wanted to analyze this full block using this neuron, then I just had to look at one pixel from this location, right? In the other case, I have the same image. This guy, these guys are looking at much smaller blocks, and then they produce their maps, okay? And then the next neuron, the, the next ne layer neuron, instead of looking at just one pixel, it's actually going to look at a group of pixels from the output of this guy, right? So your so when it looks at a group of pixels, it's basically looking at the outputs produced by this neuron in four adjacent locations, right? Which effectively gives this a single output by this guy this span. Both of them are looking at the same span. But in one case, I've sort of distributed the representation over two layers. In the other case, I've kept it in one layer, right? And, then, uh, and the reduction in the number of parameters, simply because it's a square, as you increase the dimensionality, that's going to get far, you know, more and more dramatic, right? Uh, it becomes very, it really shrinks, okay? So, basically, Distribution forces localized patterns in lower layers. It's looking for smaller patterns. It also results in a large reduction in the number of parameters. But the final story remains the same. Regardless of the distribution, we can view the network as scanning the picture as an MLP. The only difference is the manner in which the parameters are shared in the MLP, okay? So the story so far, position invariant, uh, Pattern classification can be performed by scanning the input for target pattern. The operations in scanning the input of the full network can be reordered by scanning the input with, with individual neurons in the first layer and then jointly scanning the maps produced by the first layer neurons by neurons in the second layer and so on. And the scanning block itself, the scanning operation can be distributed over many, many layers. So here's a different perspective. If you think about it now, it's exactly the same operation, but the entire operation can be redrawn as before as maps of the entire image. So I can say that the neurons in the first layer are looking for small patterns and they're scanning the input to produce maps, to, rep to, uh, to, to produce maps of what they have found. Now the neurons in the second layer are scanning the maps produced by the first layer and because you're scanning regions in the maps produced by the first layer, you're scanning larger, you're looking at larger regions in the output of the, of the, uh, uh, in the larger regions it's in the input image itself, and that is scanning, right? And then the neurons in the third layer is, are looking at the regions, at re regions in the output of the neurons in the second layer, and they're scanning. But observe that because this is really just an MLP, you're not scanning just one of the maps you're scanning all of these maps simultaneously, right? Now, does these operations hide this very important fact that the entire operation is basically the same as scanning the input with an MLP? So if you do things in any different way, that's not going to be the, that's not going to be the outcome, okay? So now, uh, and we can have any number of uh, layers in this pattern. So there's some terminology. Each of the scanning neurons is generally called a filter. That's because you're, you're drawing uh, terminology from the signal processing literature. You're calling these convolutions. You're calling those neurons filters. It's really a correlation filter that, as we saw earlier, and each filter scans for a pattern on the input. But exactly what factor pattern makes any input, any, any filter fire? That's easy to compute for the neurons in the first layer because you can just look at the pattern of weights and it will tell you what pattern it's firing for. But then as you go to the subsequent layers, things get a little more complex. And it's very, very difficult for us to be able to say what pattern uh, the neurons in the second layer, what uh, uh, patterns the neurons in the, in the higher layers are looking for. But the pattern that any neuron looks for is called its receptive field. That's just a terminology again. And the receptive field for neurons in the first layer are fairly trivial to compute. For higher layer neurons, the receptive layers, receptive fields are non-trivial to compute and must be derived. Uh, so, uh, and these patterns will not really be very simple. You can't expect that I'm looking for flowers. Something's going to be looking for 
petals, something's going to be looking for sepals. You can't really predict it. These are learned and somewhat unpredictable, right? Now, the final layer uh, may feed into an MLP or a single neuron, exactly the same as before. Now I can make some, make some modifications, right? When we were scanning the input, we were looking at a block and then we were sliding over by some amount. If I slide over by exactly one pixel, the resulting map is going to be approximately the same size as the input itself, except for the width of the patch that I'm scanning for, right? So this will, this, this, so you're maintaining size as you go, uh, as you, when you scan the image. But now, uh, instead of shifting by just one pixel, remember if I'm looking for a flower, shifting by one pixel maybe doesn't give me that much information. I can begin jumping a little more. If I shift by two pixels, what happens? The resulting map is going to be half the size as the original input. In each direction, the overall size is going to be one fourth. If I'm skipping by three pixels, it's going to be one ninth. You're going to shrink the input. So you, you call this a stride. And so you can actually, convol the, the convolution operation can have a stride and it can happen at any layer. If you're looking at the pseudocode, basically when you go from left to right in the image, you're jumping by a certain number of pixels, yes? Just quickly going back to the picture where they have parameters, can I see the left one as using bigger filters and the right one using smaller filters? They, they don't have to be bigger or smaller, right? So for example, the left one could be using two cross two filters and the right one could be using four cross four. Right. But the net result is still looking at eight cross eight. The point is I want to see eight cross eight. It doesn't matter whether I do it as eight cross eight and one cross one, or two cross two and four cross four, or four cross four and two cross two, or any other, any other combination, right? Just by distributing it, you're changing the manner in which it's representing things. You're able to look for smaller patterns in their arrangements, right? So, now there's another thing that we commonly do, which is to try to account for jitter in the image. Let's say I'm trying to look for a flower. Basically, what are the basic patterns I'm looking for? Ideally, if everything went right, I want the basic patterns, the small patterns I'm looking for, is, instead of just looking for flower, what was the point of distribution? The point of distribution was, you know, if you don't distribute, you're saying, am I finding a flower, right? But by distributing it, you're going to say, first let me look for petals, and for sepals, and for little, you know, stamens, and other little characteristics of the flower. And these are localized, they're not the size of the flower. And you expect the neurons in the first layer to be finding these localized patterns. And then the neurons in the second layer are going to say, oh, I found a bunch of petals, a sepal, you know, a sepal, a stamen, these things all occurred in the right, right, uh, right arrangement, so I think there's a flower. Or here's some pattern that represents a flower. You're distributing the manner in which you're trying to represent the information, right? But then when you think about it, if I'm trying to detect a flower, if the, uh, and if I'm looking for petals, if the petal is shift, slightly shifted, if it's jittered, then we've noticed earlier on that if I just jitter my stuff by one pixel, you're going into a completely different subspace, right? So the next neuron is going to misfire. It's not going to be able to find it. So do you really want this level of sensitivity in wow. your ability to detect patterns? Or would you like to have some degree of robustness to little shifts and variations. We would like to have a little bit of robustness and little shifts and variations. So I want to be able to say I found a petal in this region. A petal is a very localized feature, so I don't want to be looking for a big block for a petal. The petal itself is localized. But I want to be able to say that it ha happened somewhere in this region, right? This is exactly as the problem we began with in the first place. The problem that we began with in the first place was, is there a flower in this picture, right? And you look for flowers everywhere and then you found a max. You could do the same thing. You'd find for the, look for these local pa patterns within a region and pick a max. So this is an operation that's often called max pooling uh, or ma max filtering. What you will do is, when you look at the outputs of the neurons in any layer, which is a map, to represent any specific location, you'd actually look at a block of regions around it and pick the largest value, which tells you which sort of accounts for jitter, accounts for a little bit of mispositioning of the input itself. 
which can still manage to make the network fire, right? So this is basically uh, how you'd account for jitter. You would, let's say you have outputs in four consecutive blocks, and they are, you have one, one, five, and six, it, and then you're, you're going, what this means is that whatever pattern that first neuron is looking for, it was found with different confidences in these four regions, but you know that with high confidence that somewhere in this bigger block, that particular pattern was found. It has a confidence of six, which is fairly high. So you would just retain the confidence of the highest block saying, I did find a petal in this region and the confidence when I found it was six. So that was the max pulling, right? So again, the max operation is just a neuron, right? I have a bunch of inputs coming in. It's like applying a weight of one and the activation is the max, op max activation. And if you've been through the sli slides for the previous class, you can compute the max is just a standard activation. You can compute a derivative, at, le at least a subgradient. All of these can be performed. So this entire max pooling operation can be thought of as one more layer in the neuron, uh, in the network, where you are just looking at a bunch of inputs and applying a max activation. You're looking at a bunch of inputs with weight one and applying a max activation, yes. Yes. They're just numbers, it's not normalized. No, you're just saying what is the highest confidence of having found the pattern in any patch, and that itself could be low. Right, but let's say I have a match in patch one that's seven, and I have a match in patch two that's ten. But those seven and ten don't really correspond in terms of high likelihood of having a star in the patch of ten and low likelihood of having a star in patch of seven. They actually do, right? So think of it this way. Suppose I have something like one, one, seven, six, one, one. Three, four. Okay, if I'm blocking things up like so, here the max is one, here the max is seven, here the max is one, here the max is four. So I'm more likely to have found whatever pattern I'm looking for in these two guys than these two guys. And amongst those, I'm more, more likely to have found, they found it here, right? So the, the information just carries over, okay? So, the max operation, again, is just another neuron. Instead of applying an activation to the weighted sum of inputs, each neuron just computes the maximum over all, uh, all inputs. So basically, I can do the same max operation exactly as before. I can, uh, instead of thinking of it as a network component, I can also do this as a scan, right? And compute the max all over the input and actually find a, produce a max map and the same idea holds. The max operation is not a magical operation. It just happens to be another layer in your MLP where the weights are fixed and the activation is the max activation. That's about it, nothing else changes. So if you define your own, own network properly, then if you wrote your code, then the code is, the final uh, implementation is gonna be agnostic to the activation itself, which you should be, replaced, be able to replace with different things, right? So the max and the regular activations would just flip around. So it's not a big deal. Now again, this whole max pooling really only makes sense if you have strides of greater than one. Otherwise it sort of kind of loses its significance. So typically when we have max pooling, we'll be jumping over entire blocks rather than sliding by one. So the max pooling operation typically shrinks your input. And so because it's shrinking your input and because you're sort of picking one value, downsampling from a collection, the max pooling operation is often called a downsampling operation. In fact, any operation which shrinks the out size of the output is called a downsampling operation. And so if you were, for instance, striding with a step of size of two, this max operation is gonna shrink the uh, size of the output map by a factor of two in each direction, right? the size of four. So just give me a few seconds, I'm almost done here. And the whole, now the next layer. So uh, if you want to have some positional invariance in your input, then you would be scanning 
Then you perform this max pooling operation. That's going to produce some maps. The next layer is obviously going to be operating on the outputs of the max because the max is just yet another layer in the network, right? So the overall architecture is going to look something like this. You can have many layers of convolution followed by max pooling and so on. Uh, the individual perceptrons at any scanning or convol convolution layer are called filters. They filter the input image to produce an output image. The individual max operations are also called max, uh, max pooling or max filters. And this entire network is a convolutional neural network. So in the rest of the slides for today, I have, we have a little more in, uh, on the application of the same concept to uh, the, the illustrative example I've used is images. But in the remaining slides, uh, we, uh, the uh, slides illustrate this for signals like sounds, time series data, where the actual scanning is along one direction, not along two directions. Take a look. One, and when you apply the basic idea to time series data with scanning in one direction, it's called a, a time delay neural network. So take a look. And in time delay neural networks, we generally do not perform max pooling because it sort of, sort of distorts the notion of time when you're performing max pooling. Other than that, the basic ideas are just the same. We'll continue with the same idea in the next class, okay? Thank you.